Hallelujah. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 4, verse 31. Amen. Acts chapter 4, verse 31. If you have it, say amen. amen. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. This morning, I want to speak for the next few moments on the subject, the gathering that God blesses. Let us pray. Father, we love you, adore you this morning. We are privileged to come together to your house to celebrate and to worship you. Now we pray, Father, that you may just grant your servant an anointing to preach your word, not just a sermon, but your word to us. And I pray that our hearts will be receptive to your word. I pray that we will just Embrace it and assimilate it and continue to become the men and women of God you have called us to be. We ask for your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name and everyone said amen. You may be seated. A little backdrop of this verse that I read to you. When you go back to Acts Chapter 3, you, you know the story of Peter and John going to the temple to pray. They see a lame man. The lame man is asking for alms, and they say, we don't have anything to give you but silver and gold. We don't have but such as I have. They pray for, the, they pray for this uh, lame man, and he's healed. A crowd gathers around the temple, and Peter preaches to the crowd about Christ. And the Bible says that after he preached, the church grew from 3,000 to 5,000. Instantly, in one moment. But the religious leaders were angry and they didn't like that the fact that Peter and John were preaching about Christ. So they arrested Peter and John because they had been preaching about the resurrected Christ. They wouldn't have had a problem had they been preaching about Christ who died. Christ, who the wonderful man who healed the sick, claimed to be God, buried, and never resurrected. That's not a problem. But when they started preaching at Christ, they rose from the dead and made them look bad. So they arrested Peter and John. And threw them in the slammer overnight. The next morning, they faced the religious court system, the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin tried to intimidate them and said, by what power or by what name have you done this? Who do you think you are to preach about a resurrected Christ, a Christ that we found guilty, a Christ that we just a few weeks ago uh, uh, sentenced to death? And he hung on the cross and we buried him. Now there's rumors that he rose from the dead, but we don't want those rumors. And, and some people claim they've seen him, but we don't want that news out because the people know that he really rose from the dead, that that means everything that he said is true. And we want to control the narrative. So what did Peter do? Peter preached before the court system. He preached to Jesus. And then they threatened and commanded him not to speak or teach Jesus. They said, okay, we're going to let you go. We're going to be nice. And we're going to let you go, but don't you preach about Jesus again because next time it's going to be worse. And Peter and John replied and said, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to God? You be the judge. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. In other words, Peter and John told the religious people, you do what you have to do, I do what I have to do. 
You do what you have to do. I do what I have to do. And I know what God has called me to do. And then the Bible says they were further threatened and released. And this is where it gets interesting. Peter and John, after they were released, after they were rattled, after they were threatened, you go, you preach about Jesus again, we're going to go after you, we're going to go after your reputation, we're going to go after your profile, we're going to make sure you're fired by your boss, we're going to make sure that we file charges against you, we're going to persecute your family. You preach Jesus, we're going to come after you hard. Many people would have said, okay, you know what, I'm going to lay low. I want to lay low because I'm, you know, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want my family, my health, my children, my, my, my career to be affected. So I'm going to go lay low and be an undercover Christian, at least for a while until everything settles. But no, Peter and John, once they left the court system, they went straight, the Bible says they went straight to their companions. The NIV says they went to their own people. What does that mean? They went straight to church. I said they went straight to church. And when they went to church, they had church. They had church. The Bible says they all raised their voices together. And I read that. And, and when they went there, the Bible says, and when they had prayed, they prayed together. The place where they were assembled, gathered together, together, was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Not just Peter and John. Everyone got filled again with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. The key word there. Is they. The key word is they. The key word was the gathering of the saints. Something happened when they got together. Something incredible happened when they cried out to God together. Something happened, the place was shaken when they celebrated Christ and, and prayed to God together. They had church. The first time that the word church is mentioned in the Bible, it was mentioned by Jesus before the church was actually birthed. See, the, the church was birthed after Jesus died, rose from the dead, went to heaven, sent the Holy Ghost down. And that's chapter 2. And the, the disciples were in the upper room and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and the church was birthed. But the first time the word church is mentioned in the Bible was mentioned by Jesus before the church was birthed. When he said in Matthew 16, 18, just listen to it, I will build my church. I will build my church. Two personal pronouns, I will build my church, not I will build your church, Cortez, or Cortez, you will build my church. I will build my church. I'm going to do this. I'm not thinking about it. It's not just a plan and pencil. I am going to build my church. And, there, and, and here's the rest of the story. And the gates of hell shall not prevail. Now, I did a little study about what is the gates of hell. The gates of hell or the gates of Hades uh, talks about the place where the people that had died, the saints of the Old Testament had died and they had gone to paradise, the, the courtroom of heaven. The courtroom of, uh, not the courtroom, the courtyard of heaven. And they were in paradise. The gates of Hades is the place of the abode of the dead. And you stay there until you're released. When Jesus died, follow me. When Jesus died and before he rose from the dead, he went downstairs. He went to paradise. And he preached the gospel there in Hades. He preached the gospel. And the Bible said he says that he set the captives free. He set those, uh, those saints from the Old Testament, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, he set them free. They were in paradise. They were in, in, in the good side of paradise. And he set them free so they could experience heaven because he is the way to heaven. So when he says here, I will build my church, I'm going to build my church. When I raise from the dead, I'm going to build my church. 
But the devil's going to try to keep me from being risen from the dead. He's trying to keep me within the gates of hell to keep me downstairs. But I'm going to go beyond the gates of Hades, and I'm going to raise from the dead. I'm going to resurrect. And when I resurrect, I'm going to go to heaven. I am going to build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. Hallelujah. And that's exactly what he did. So when you hear the phrase, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail, it it should tell you two things. First, that the church is the most precious thing on earth. I will build my church. Anything that, that is built by God, anything that's created by God, he loves. And Jesus is saying, I am going to build my church. The most precious thing on earth right now, folks, the most precious thing on earth is the church of Jesus Christ. But when we read that also, it tells us that the most hated thing on earth is the church of Jesus Christ. Heaven loves the church. It's the most blessed thing that God sees on earth. We are part of the church. The most hated thing on earth by the devil is the church. God is building the church and the enemy is trying to cancel the church. That's where the battle is. Not only is the church the most precious, beloved object of God's affection on earth, but the Bible says that Jesus is coming back one day for the church. In fact, he calls the church his bride. But before he comes back for his bride, the Bible tells us that he sent the Holy Spirit. He went to heaven. He sent the Holy Ghost down. He sent the Holy Spirit And what is the purpose of the Holy Spirit? Oh, I'm going to teach you this morning. I I need to preach. This morning the Lord has led me to preach some doctrine here. He sent the Holy Spirit to serve as the wedding coordinator of the future wedding when Christ comes on his bride. And the Holy Spirit's purpose as the wedding coordinator is to make sure the bride is prepared without spot or wrinkle. And not only did God send, Christ sent the wedding coordinator, the Holy Spirit, the Lord sent wedding gifts in advance. And the wedding gifts, we know them as the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And the reason he sent the wedding gifts to the church is not just to make the church happy, but the purpose of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the purpose of the wedding gifts is for the edification of the church, to build up the church. In fact, not only did he send wedding gifts, but some specific gifts, he sent them as people gifts. People gifts to edify the church. He sent the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher not to entertain the church. God hasn't called me to be a pastor, to entertain you, and to be a personality, and to have a YouTube channel, and have a blue check. God has sent me and the fivefold ministry as people gifts to the church, not to entertain, but to edify and equip the church. God sends gifts to edify the church. So would you then agree, therefore, that the church is the most precious thing on earth that God loves, that Christ builds, that he sends the wedding coordinator, that he sends wedding gifts. Will you then therefore agree that the greatest blessing that God sends to earth is to the church. Then listen to this. There is no fullness of blessing. There is blessing but no fullness of blessing when we disassociate or distance ourselves from the very thing that God decided to bless with his best. God decided, can you give me a little more volume because I don't want to lose my voice. God has 
given the church. He has blessed the church with the best. And when we disassociate ourselves from the, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but I want you to learn this so you can help teach this to others. When we disassociate ourselves from the blessed church, we cheat ourselves from the fullness of the blessings that God has for us. You see, folks, often we treat church like an optional side dish. We either love it, we love it, but we're not devoted to it. We say we love church, but we're not committed to it. He built it, but oftentimes we dismiss it. Uh, and one reason we dismiss it is because sometimes we don't like who God has included. Because if we were God, had God asked us about the church, we would really pick who comes in here. We want people from a certain background, certain look, a certain skin color, certain social economic. We would not want riffraff in the church. We would be very picky. And you have now churches now that do that. They study demographics. They're hitting certain zip codes only. They, oh, we need more churches. It's amazing. Yes, we need, we need more churches. But it's amazing that the whole church planting movement is targeting high profile, high economic, high demographic neighborhoods. They're not targeting the poor and the press. They're not t targeting the inner city. They're not targeting poor countries. They're targeting where people have high incomes. Because that tells me that we want to be picky on the type of people that comes to our church. And sometimes we are picky and we don't like who is there. We don't like who is on the platform. We don't like who is in leadership. So we boycott church. Can someone help me? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We don't like who's included. We don't like, and sometimes there's people that don't like the church when the church is so different from the real world. Oh, you, Pastor Cortez, you need to live in the real world. The church needs to be like, reflect like the real world. The church needs to begin look like the real world. And then we have it backwards. We have the tail wagging the dog. Listen, we're not, we're not called to let the world influence us with their culture. We are called to influence the world, influence the culture of the world with the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. But it's easy. It's easy. Uh, a lot of people don't like that. They want the church to look and act like the world so we can attract more people, more people in the seats, uh, more people, more people coming to the show, more people coming to the off-Broadway production. And we want it to be more of a Broadway production. We want to we do a song and a dance and a pony show so that we could attract. And that's not the church, but we want to we, we, we we, we compete with numbers. Hallelujah. Some people don't like the fact that preachers preach, come as you are, but don't stay as you are. Oh, I come as you are, come, come as you are. But I pray that when someone comes to our church, the Holy Spirit will captivate them and then will stay as they are. Hallelujah. Well, pastor, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. You don't have to go to church to be a Christian. That is true. You don't have to go to church to be a Christian. But if you want to be a strong Christian, you have to go to church. Amen. Let me say it again. You don't have to go to church to be a Christian. But to be a strong Christian, you have to go to church. Why? Because it is the church that has the gifts of operation. It is the it's church that has the wedding coordinator working within the church. It is the church that has the wedding gifts and operation. You, we cheat ourselves when we don't go to church. I'm being a pastor this morning. This is not an evangelist sermon. I get it. This is the Pastor Cortez sermon. But before, now, we, but we, first we have to understand what is church. I know many of us were raised in church and we think we know church. We know how to do church. We know how to be the church. We have all the, the church lingo. But I, I'm under the oppression and I realize now that many people, they think they know what church is, how church should function, how church should sound. They don't really understand what exactly is the church. The church is not a building. It is not this beautiful building. That's not the church. Uh, the church is not a denomination. 
Someone help me say amen. It's not a denomination. It includes, it includes the church, but a church is not a denomination. A church is not programs. A church is not organizations. A church is not just organizations that are non-religious, non-profit, tax-exempt. That's not really the church. The church is not, uh, it's, it's not a venue that is driven by a, a popular personality. That's not what God meant to be the church. To understand what the, what the word church means, you have, to, uh, you have to understand what the word is in the Greek. And the, in the Greek, the word church is ekklesia, E-K-K-L-E-S-I-A. Ekklesia. Ekklesia is what the word is in Greek. Ekklesia, those of you that come from a Spanish background like I am, uh, do you know that the Spanish word for church is iglesia? The word iglesia comes in Spanish from the Greek word ekklesia. Now we understand the ekklesia. What is the ekklesia, meaning the Greek word for church? Ekklesia is this. Those that are called out to gather together in an assembly. The word assembly is also means ecclesia. Those that call that, hey, come on, come on, out of the world, out of the world, out of the Mary clay, God has saved you, God has saved you, you're redeemed, 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 you're redeemed, you're redeemed, come, come. You're redeemed, redeemed, redeemed. You, you're not redeemed, get redeemed, get saved. Okay, now come, come, come. Those that are called out of the world to come to gather together. To come together. In other words, ecclesia is the gathering of the people of God. That is the ecclesia. Hallelujah. So what is then the top purpose of ecclesia? What is the main, 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 main thing of the ecclesia? Why do they, why do they gather together? So we could be entertained, so we could hear a hip pastor, so we could have programs. What's the main reason of ecclesia, the gathering? Listen carefully. The main top purpose of ecclesia is to encounter the powerful presence of of God in a different and unlike any other time to experience the power of the presence of God corporately in a way we cannot individually. That is the main purpose. We gather together so that the place can be shaken like we read in verse 31. So that we can uh, be empowered with the Holy Spirit and that we can be filled with boldness. That is the main purpose. But pastor, I, you know, uh, we don't, you know, I, I have church all by myself. Uh, pastor, uh, we can, you know, we, we don't have to, and I, and I get it. Listen, I understand. Yes, we can live and walk and talk with Jesus by ourselves. God has blessed me a zillion times, just me and him in my prayer closet. Yes, we can experience the precious times of refreshing all by ourselves, solitude with God. I understand that, and I celebrate it, and I challenge you to do that. But there is something powerful. There is something extraordinary, extraordinary that is only reserved and experienced when God's people gather together. There is a group plan blessing that is reserved only when God's people gather together. Matthew 18, verse 19 and 20, Jesus said, again I say to you, that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two, I know, I know we grew up with this verse, but I want to re read it again and show you something. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Here's the point. There is a special source of power that occurs when we come together. Ask Peter and John. Why did they go straight to church? 
Because there's a special source of power that only happens when you come to church. Only happens when we come to the ecclesia, the gathering of the saints. Please understand this verse. Understand something here. It says here where two or three, three are gathered. By implication, it means of four or five, or 50 or 100, or 1,500. It doesn't matter the amount. It's more than two, not just one. But when at least two or three gather together, why is that important? Because there's agreement. You cannot agree with yourself. You have to agree with somebody else. When you have more than one person that comes together in agreement, or three, or four, or five, or a hundred, whatever it is, something happens. The Bible says when two or three are gathered together, there is a power that is attracted to that agreement. Listen carefully. Please understand. The power is not in our number. The power is in the name. I said the power is not in the number. The power is in the name. I was raised in a storefront church that had 80 chairs. We had maybe 30, 40 people that had church. But we had power in that storefront, not because of the numbers, but because of the name. Some of you were raised in a little country church that, that just had barely benches and didn't have a lot of people. But you experienced God in that little church. You were delivered in that church. You will feel the Holy Spirit, not because of the numbers, but because of the name of Jesus Christ, where two or three are gathered in his name. Be careful you're chasing numbers. Yes, it's okay to keep statistics. Yes, it's okay to keep documents. But be careful. It is in the name of Jesus. There is something powerful that is only reserved when we gather together. That's how the church was birthed. When they gathered together in the upper room, 120 people, even though 500 saw him go to heaven and heard him say before he went to heaven, I'm, I'm, don't leave this place. I'm sending the Holy Ghost. Yeah, 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 yeah. 380 went home, never came back. 120 continued to wait. And it was then that the Bible says when they were in one place and in one accord, they were together, together. They were gathered together in the same place. Then the Holy Spirit came down. Hallelujah. With Brother Cortez, I, had, I could have church all by myself. I've had church all by myself, and I get it. I, I, I know what you mean. I, I know the phraseology. I've used that phrase. Well, man, I had church. I was home by myself. I downloaded my Spotify praise, Brooklyn Tabernacle music, ooh, and I had church all by myself. Actually, that is incorrect. For church is the ecclesia, the gathering of the saints. The implication is where the two or three are gathered. You cannot have church all by yourself. In other words, you, you could be blessed by yourself. You could experience the blessing of God. You could experience heaven on earth. You could experience uh, uh, the refill of God. You could experience all those things. And if you haven't, I urge you to do that. I've been blessed many times by myself, but I didn't have church. Because church is where two or three are gathered. Church is the gathering of the saints. Church is when you bring your gifts, you bring your gifts, you bring your gifts, and we come together. And your gifts bless me, and my gifts bless you. Your gifts edify the church, my gifts edify the church. That's the purpose of church. You, you can't, you, you can't. You could be blessed at home, and I know people that, that they go to church only when they, they, only when they, have, they have the mood, when I feel like it. But they'll stay home or they'll stay home for three or four weeks, and then they'll come whenever. They come up for air, you know. Uh, um. <laughs> Hallelujah. Listen carefully. When you're not in church... And I know I'm preaching to the choir, but I, I need to establish this. But I want to make sure that we, we, we're on the same page. You cannot, when you, when you are not in church, when you're not in the ecclesia, the gathering of the saints, you cannot experience all by yourself, you cannot experience embraces. 
you cannot be used by God in the gifts. Because the gifts in you are meant to edify the church. You can't have the elders of the church lay hands on you. A lot of times we'll have people come up for prayer. Why do I have them come up? Because there's something that happens when we come together in prayer. When we lay hands on you, when the church people are praying together, something happens differently than when you pray for yourself. I've, I've prayed for myself many times. I've encouraged myself. But there's something happens when I have the ecclesia pray with me. You cannot, you cannot experience ecclesia. And please understand this. You cannot experience ecclesia through Zoom. Oh, I had church. I had it's not the same. And I know we have people that can't leave the house. They, 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 we have many older folks in our church that during the past two years have been homebound. They can't come out. And I thank God for online. I thank God for the, you, our YouTube channel. I praise God for that. But the fact is, it's not the same. It's not, have you, you know, have you ever, have you ever, uh, gone to, to a concert of someone, someone, a Christian artist, a Christian person, and you have all the music, and you love the music. You have seen online, you have seen their concerts, and you were blessed, and you were incredible, but then you got to see them in person. You got to see them in person, and suddenly they sing all the same songs that you know, that, and, 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 but there was something different when you were in the room with them. You experienced something when you were enjoying what they were doing, and you were people of kindred spirit, people that were wired like you. There was something different that was not the same like a DVD. You cannot have church by yourself. You can be blessed by yourself. You cannot have church by yourself. We say, just would you come? But then, why, why does God bless me privately? How come when I'm in a prayer closet, I experience the presence of God? I experience the anointing of God in prayer. Oh, Pastor Cortez, I was in praying and fasting for three days. And for three days, I, I felt the Shekinah glory in my prayer closet. Oh, God spoke to me. And I wrote all kinds of scriptures and words. And those things are wonderful. Don't stop. Do that often. I do that often. But listen carefully. The reason that God pours into you in your private prayer closet is so that you can be poured out out when we gather together. Someone praise the Lord. Hallelujah. The anointing he pours upon your life is not for you. I said the anointing that he pours upon your life is not for you. We are poured in in private so that we can be poured out in public. God anoints you, not just to reward you, but to prepare you for an assignment. Hallelujah. Jesus did that. We read in Luke 4, 18 that Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. He didn't stop there. He's anointed me so that I can preach the gospel, so that I can heal the brokenhearted. He anoints you so that you can pour it out to be a blessing. He doesn't anoint you, just reward you so that you can take a plaque and hang it on the wall. The anointing is not for you. The anointing is for you to share with others. You are poured in so you can pour it out. And then what happens when I pour it out? You go back in, you're poured in in private, and you're poured out. How it works, church. Would you stand? Let's say a couple more things. The New Testament believers. The New Testament ecclesia, the New Testament believers built their lives around ecclesia. Follow me. I'm like a salmon now. I'm going upstream when everybody else is doing the opposite. The New Testament believers built their lives around ecclesia. 
the Old Testament, the children of God, when they were traveling in the wilderness, they camped around the fire of God. In other words, whenever the glory of God, the fire or the cloud by day, the fire by night rested, they would set up their tents and settle there. They were parked around, they were parked together, gathered together around the presence, the powerful presence of God. In other words, I believe that we should build our lives around Ecclesia, the gathering of the saints. We should hunger to be with God's people in God's presence. Why? Because the fullness of the blessing occurs with the ecclesia. I will build my church. There's a greater blessing that happens that only happens when we are gathered together. Even the Old Testament people understood that. It still amazes me how believers today in 2022, intelligent believers, smart believers, believers with multiple college degrees, believers who are very successful in their careers, Entrepreneur, we have a few entrepreneurs in this church. You, you have built stuff from the ground up. It still amazes me how believers can plan ahead their careers. Smart believers can plan ahead their college. Well, I, my SAT is 5,000. So I'm gonna go to I'm gonna go to this school, that school. I'm gonna get a full ride, but I'm gonna check out the programs of this school and that school, and I'm gonna check out the dorms with the living. I want the dorms where they pre-select everybody. I want to make sure my dorms has a jacuzzi. Mesa's that people plan their college. There's people, smart people, they plan the dream house. This is the top, my next house is going to have this, it's going to have this. It's going to be closer to shopping. It's going to be closer to this. It's going to be uh, closer to restaurants because I live, what I live, I have to drive forever. But I want to be close and my next house is going to, they plan everything so well. We have, I, know, I know smart believers, they plan their retirement so well. I have my portfolio, I have my this, and my stocks, and my bonds, and my social security. And they manage it so well. And when I retire, I'm going to retire. I'm not just going to retire. I'm, I'm going to plan now because I don't want, I don't want life to happen. I'm, I'm going to plan. I'm going to retire here in that neighborhood, in this, in this location where people live, and I'm going to, I want to retire near a college town. I want to be near a young life, and I'm going to be, I want to have the right restaurants. We plan all those things. So it amazes me how believers can plan ahead about all these things, but never plan to search for a church in Ecclesia. I am not getting amens. Oh, I'm going to move here. Great zip code, great shopping, great this and great that. And then I even bother, is there a healthy church nearby? Is there any, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll do it afterwards. I'm not getting a man, because some of you did that. And, and, and you're blessed that you found a church. And that's called the mercy of God, but you're going to move someplace that they didn't have a Holy Ghost church. But it amazes me that we make life decisions, our career decisions, moving up the ladder decisions, and never plan ecclesia. Or we plan all kinds of things during the year, and all kinds of things, but we don't say, you know what, I haven't been in ecclesia for a while. Maybe I, I don't have to go to that event. Maybe I don't have to go, you know, I'm, I'm, tired, of going, I'm tired of coming up for air. 
I'm being a pastor this morning. So if you don't like it, talk to the guy who hired me. Church. When my wife was single, and this is a story that she shared. She was a nurse, and she wanted to leave with the town she was at and pursue her career in another city. A city that was bigger, that had thriving uh, program. She wanted to move up her career. And she had a wise pastor tell her this. He said, Rebecca, you could move wherever you want. You could pursue a nurse career in any city. Everyone wants to hire you. You're a good nurse, have a good record, good recommendations. You can live wherever. But before you start making a commitment to, to relocate, before you do that, the first thing you have to do, my wife can tell you, first, he said, first thing you have to do, find out if there's a good church nearby. If you cannot find a good church in a certain city that has a good program, don't move there. I ain't getting amens. Find a good church. Find a good ecclesia. A place where there's a gathering. A place that they gather not for a showtime. A place that you gather for the presence of God. A place that is shaken. A place that prays. A place that preaches the gospel without compromise. A place that will hold you accountable. I'm preaching part two of this message Wednesday night. You don't want to miss that. This is my first point. A place where, the, where, where there's a presence. Wednesday night I'm preaching the, the place where there's protection. That's what I'm doing right now. I'm teaching you because I'm protecting you. He said, you want to find a place that will, that, there's power and there's protection. So before she moved to Dallas, she found a church. There was, there, there, there was, they had the gathering, they had, they had the accountability. And based upon that, then she took a job in Parkland in Dallas. I say that because we've been here for many years and I've seen many people make decisions, life decisions, careers or college, and church is the last thing they consider, smart people. Their schedule is based upon the next event, the next program, the next, the next out of town. And they never consider ecclesia. And they cheat themselves. When my wife and I are on vacation, the, one of the first things I do before I go on vacation, is there a church that I could go to on that Sunday? You go to church on Sunday? I do. Why? Not be, because you, you go to church because you're on a guilt trip? No, 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 no. It's not because I'm on a guilt trip. I need the ecclesia. And I know I've been some churches that have disappointed me. But you know what? There's always a few remnants that people, they love the Lord, I still get blessed. I do that because I want to be edified. There's something that happens only when you gather together. Your children will only learn that from you parents. If you only go when it works with your schedule. If you schedule your, your, your schedule, your career all around and in churches, like, oh, I guess we can't go to church that Sunday. Oh, I can't. If you do that, then don't be surprised when your children stop coming to church. Well, I raised them in church. No, 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 no. You didn't raise them in church. You accommodated them, but they understood that it was not a priority. The gathering of the saints, the ecclesia was not a priority. More is caught than taught. You heard me say that a million times. There was a very difficult time in my life. I was 30 years old and I quit the ministry. And one of the reasons I quit is because I was, people turned on me. I was betrayed. I was stabbed in the back in the ministry. In the ministry. People in the ministry just turned on me. Jealousy, whatever it was. And it was the worst time of my life. My mother had a psychotic breakdown. ended up in a rubber room. An adopted sister was jump, trying to jump off buildings. I didn't have money. And I had every reason not to go to church. Just stay home and listen to my cassettes. We didn't have CDs, cassettes. And have church all by myself. And I was tempted to do that. Oh, I just need time to, I just need time to heal. So I'm not going to go to church because I need time to heal. 
And I, I've heard that phrase, I just need time to heal. I'm not ready for church. I'm not ready for church. I need time for heal. And I, I could have church all by myself. I had I, this Christian TV, you know. And I, I, I was ready to do that. Then I realized, something in me realized that you need ecclesia. There's something you need, the blessings to only happen in ecclesia. And I realized that if I had stopped going to ecclesia, I would eventually self-destruct. I needed that. So I remember during that time, I would drive, for those of you, and you've heard the story, for those of you who know New York City, I was living in Westchester County. And I would drive all the way to Long Island City, Queens, to go to church, Evangel uh, Church in Long Island City. And sometimes they had two services. Sometimes I would stay in both services because I needed ecclesia. I, and you know what? I don't remember most of the sermons at all. But I remember there was something I would leave there feeling strengthened, feeling blessed. And sometimes they didn't have a big altar call, but I, there was something, a blessing that only occurred when I was in ecclesia. So I would go sometimes to both services, go back home, drive back, over the bridge again, Thrive Snake Bridge or Triborough Bridge, go back there, had Sunday night, and I wouldn't get, not because I was on a guilt trip, because I needed ecclesia. And then go back, and then on Tuesdays, I would drive from Westchester County all the way to Brooklyn Tabernacle in Brooklyn. Two bridges. Get there early, park in the street, walk five blocks. They're not, they're not a church of 8,000 people has no parking lot. And I would park and walk and sit there at the prayer meetings. Why? I needed ecclesia. I needed to experience the presence of God. I needed to be with God's people. And I didn't even know who they were. I, I didn't have a lot of friends there. I needed ecclesia. And I, and I remember home, driving home many times being blessed. And I can't tell you the sermon. I can't tell you the messages. But I remember I felt a bless. And then Wednesday night, I would be back at Evangel Temple. Why did I do that? Because I learned that I needed Ecclesia, and Ecclesia needed me. And I survived that hump. And for me, being in Ecclesia is so important. Not because I'm the pastor. And when I live in Tyler, Texas, and, I, and the Lord led me to a small church with just a handful of people, they didn't sing the songs I like. I thought they were hillbilly. And everyone was married, I was single, like Noah's Ark, two by two, then this Cortez. You know, those type of churches, everything is family, family, couples, and then just you. You could come too. <laughs> you could come too. You know, I remember going to Cracker Barrel, you know, by myself. In restaurants, Martinez, party of four. Martinez, Martinez. Coleman's party of five. Hey, 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 hey. The Bubble Family party of eight. No, 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 no. And everyone's like, and then Cortez party of one. And everyone turned. Who is the freak? Who is the freak show? Single adults, you know what I'm talking about, right? That's what my wife and I, we love single adults. We were older single when we got married. But I would go to churches, in, in that church. But you know what? I was blessed. I grew in that church. It was during that time, doing a, a Wednesday night service with 18 people, that God spoke to me and God said, follow the cloud, not the crowd. And you've heard me say that many times. It happened in the midst of God's people doing a prayer meeting. I'm telling you, there's a blessing that only occurs in ecclesia. There's other blessings, but don't cheat yourself. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed, I have a business. That, listen, the business that you have, the blessing you have, the schedule you have, the education you have, all those things, God gave it to you so you can manage it. Don't let it manage you. I said, you're blessed, don't let it manage you. You manage it. You're the boss. You say, I'm going to church. I don't need to go to the convent. I don't need to do that. Kids, we're going to church. I'll tell you, when you do that, your children one day will thank you. Oh, I'm picking on Elizabeth here. Elizabeth, you still here? Yeah, yeah, you are. Look at that, you didn't walk out. 
they were always in church, involved in impact girls and children's ministry, youth ministry. And I know they go to church not because they have to, because they want to. And you continue, you flourish in church. Why? Because that's where the gifts are in operation. The gifts are in operation in the church. The anointing flows for the purpose of the church. Every head by your close. Father, we love you this morning. Lord, I have preached what you have told me to preach. I have taught the folks, by people that may have known this, people never heard this. Lord, you know and I know I didn't do this just to build numbers. This was a principle that we see in the New Testament church, the principle we see, we see in the Bible. And we want, to, we want to receive all that you have for us. Remain standing. We're going to close by celebrating communion. If, I'll just, if you could come to the front first before you serve anybody, come to the front first. If you did not receive a, a little sealed container, raise, raise your hand, keep it up. Just high up so in the ushers. Make sure everyone whose hand is up has to be there's a whole bunch here on the left. Amen. Praise the Lord. Keep your hands up until you received it. That's, how, that's the only way we know. And just hold on to it. Don't peel it. I'm hearing peeling. And I'm going to go right towards you. But just hold on to it. We have type A people here. Get the show on the road. If I could peel before everybody else, I could drink it before everybody else. No. We're going to do this together. Ecclesia together. Amen. A few more hands over there. Has everyone been served? Who has not been served? Wave. Okay. Let me read you one more verse before we receive communion. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, 25. And let us consider one another. In other words, it's not about you. It's about the church family. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. It's not about you being encouraged. Maybe you need to encourage somebody else. Sometimes you get encouraged by encouraging somebody else. Stirring up. Maybe sometimes when you go to church, maybe God will call you early in the morning and say, Hey, Georgie, get up. It's church. I don't Get up. I'll come and get you. I'm going to get to you at 9.15 for Sunday school. I don't do something. No, I'm going to pick you up. Sometimes that's how you stir each other up. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking or neglecting the assembling, the ecclesia of ourselves together. In other words, not giving up meeting together as is the manner or the habit of some, but instead exhorting one another and so much more as to see the day approaching. If there's ever a time that we need ecclesia, it's now as the world is getting crazier and crazier and crazier. Listen, parents, we watch the news. We see what's happening with our kids in many of our public schools. But now they're fighting so that drag queens can come and read books to your children. And children are being kicked out of school because they're standing up, they're standing upon biblical principles. They, they, we have children being called racist or children being called uh, homophobics and children being attacked. This is crazy. This is not like even five, ten years ago. Where people, you could get fired for even having a Bible. You could rattle cages and get in trouble for, I mean, the politics is crazy. Come on, am I right? 
Churches are afraid to preach from the gospel, preach the gospel from the front because pastors are afraid there's going to be a picket outside. And suddenly, the America that we remember is not the America that we're experiencing now. If there's ever a reason we need more of Ecclesia and so much more as you see the day approaching. Not to come and be hyped up and be encouraged. Come on, everybody, put your hands together. Yo, yo, yo. No, no, no. You and I know that's called hype. It may work for a while, but by the time you get to the parking, the hype wears out. You need an encounter with the presence of God. You need, to, you need someone to preach the word of God, not just a motivational spiel. Even now more. You want to make sure your children are being discipled by yourself and we come and help you. I'm, I'm looking forward for our, our, our new youth and young adult pastor. I appreciate Pastor Ruben. You've done such a tremendous job. Thank you. Because you are a pastor. But I'm looking forward for our new full-time, because he was doing this part-time, full-time, you, he's a pastor. And I told him, I said, I want you, uh, Pastor Noah, I want you, when you have to, you come, I want you to do altar calls. I want you to lay hands on our youth and pray for them. I want you to embrace them. I want you to be a pastor, not a youth social director. Yeah, do pizza party. Go, go mountain climbing and do all the stuff. Don't invite me for those. But get, do, do, all, do, do the fun. But you be a pastor. I want to I want use our kids to be impacted by the ecclesia. If you have your cup, would you peel the top clear part? You don't have to peel it 100%. You can let it hang, dangle. And then would you take the wafer or the piece of bread, hold it on the night of his betrayal, the night that Jesus was betrayed and then arrested and taken to a kangaroo court to be sentenced to death. He had one last meeting with the disciples. You've heard the phrase, a come to Jesus meeting. This was the ultimate come to Jesus meeting. And he said, don't to them together. They were doing this together, folks, together. He said, do this together in remembrance of me. Remember my body together. Because when you remember together, then you help to remind each other. Do this often in remembrance of me. Because there's going to be time you're going, you're going to want to forget. Was that real? Was, that, was, was Jesus really real? Was he a figment of my imagination? And you need to remember and remind each other, stir each other up that I'm real. And I'm steady. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. Don't you forget it. And do this often because you will want to forget. Would you partake this morning? And then would you carefully peel the silver part slowly, really slow, no hurry, because if you do it fast, it's going to spill on you, and then you're going to have to take your clothes to the laundry. And I don't want to have Pastor Brock going around looking for grape juice stain on the carpet. And he said, do this and remember... In remembrance to me. In fact, what they did, they had, we're not going to do this here, but they had one big cup and they passed a the cup. And everyone drank from the same cup. Okay? We don't do that here. You're saying, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> the, the ultimate super spreader, right? <laughs> but it's the principle partaking. By taking, being reminded that I can do this through the power of the blood. I can do this. You can do this. In fact, before you partake, 
turn to your left and to your right and tell the person to your left and your right, I can do this. Go on, go on. I can do this. I, I, I can do this. Meaning, I, you can do life. I can do this. Pastor, why did you have us do that? Ecclesia. To remind you that we're sitting together, that we are together. And after we partake, after we partake, when you leave, say hi to different people. Greet one another. Don't just run to your car. Oh, I need to pick up the kid. Take 30 seconds, greet each other. Why? Because that's part of the ecclesia. Family of God. And Jesus said, don't forget, you can do this through my blood. Would you partake? Hold on to it. Hold on to the cup. Don't squeeze it because it's making crack noise. And then I'm going to zero in on you. Amen. Just hold on to it. I'm going to pray and dismiss you. I know many of you, because of your schedule, midweek is difficult. But if you're able to work your schedule, I invite you to come Wednesday night. I'm going to preach part two. My first point today was we gather together so we can experience the power, the powerful presence. My next two points, and I'm going to do that Wednesday night so that we can experience protection. That's what I'm doing. Right I'm protecting you by teaching you truth. And we come together so we can be planted. I'm going to talk about that Wednesday night. It's going to bless you and encourage you. Amen. Every head bow of your eye closed. Father, we thank you this morning. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you for the principles that we find in the Word of God that will help us live victorious, abundant lives. Thank you for the church. Not what we try to remake, Lord. Nowadays people are building churches that it's really not really a church, it's, it's an entertainment. We know that. We have people trying to start churches that to blur the line between the sacred and the secular. Lord, you never meant the bride to look like the world. You never meant the bride to act and giggle like the world. You never meant the bride to dress like the world. You meant the bride to be very special, very distinct. That's why you sent the wedding the wedding coordinator, the Holy Spirit. That's why you sent the wedding gifts, because you love the church. And I pray, Father, that we will just be excited about being part of the ecclesia, the gathering of the saints. Not for hype, but for Holy Spirit. Not for entertainment, but for worship and for word. Oh God, help us raise our families in the way they should go. Help us raise our family and teaching our children and our youth the principles of the Bible. Lord, we thank you for Pastor Debbie and, and Pastor Ruben and our youth pastor and Pastor Cortez and Pastor Rebecca. And we thank you for Pastor Chad. But our job is to equip the saints to do the work in the ministry. Our job is not to raise everyone's kids. Our job is to help our families raise the kids in the way that you go. And Father, we trust you this morning. We love you. And we leave today joyfully greeting one another because we are the ecclesia. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen, amen. God bless you. Love one another. We'll see you Wednesday night. Amen.